here. So again, thank you all for coming uh, for Brochure Audubon Days. This is a, a big uh, weekend for us as we unveil our brand new exhibit over there of the uh, Brochure Audubon uh, exhibit. So uh, and you'll learn about that more throughout the day. So, uh, but right now we've got uh, an interesting presentation. Uh, Mr. James Duncan is our guest, and uh, James Duncan has ancestry that includes Osage on his mother's side and Cherokee on his father's. He is an archaeologist, educator, author, and Osage scholar. He served as director of the Missouri State Museum, exhibits director for the Missouri Department of Conservation, and also worked in public education. Jim directed the Conservation Department's three-year statewide programming for the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial from 1983 to 1986. Jim has lectured at Washington University, the History Museum, and throughout the state uh, while on the Missouri Humanities Council Speakers Bureau. Jim co-authored the Petroglyphs and Pictographs of Missouri, co-edited the Rock Art of Eastern North America and Picture Cave, as well as published a number of articles on Osage icono uh, icon icon iconography. There you go. <laughs> That's a tough one. And oral traditions in various edited volumes. Duncan is an accomplished historic gunsmith, specializing in 18th century American Indian trade guns, and has contributed essays on the early fur trade era. Okay, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell he knows his stuff. We brought him here uh, specifically today uh, to, to uh, talk about uh, some of the guns that Audubon used uh, during his day. And uh, we've, we've titled his uh, presentation, uh, Birds and Buckshot. We thought that was kind of cute. <laughs> so anyway, we'll turn things over to James, and we thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I didn't write that thing. <laughs> Most of the information is available on various posters that have been in the post office. A <laughs> uh, couple of little things that we have to do, and I hope you don't mind, but one of the things we're doing now is we're doing land acknowledgments. Are any of you familiar with that? We always acknowledge that before the Spanish in 1541, the French, 1673, the British, 1763, and then the Americans, 1783. After all of those people, the original inhabitants of Missouri were forced from their homeland by 1825, and Governor Lilburn, Lilburn Bog declared it illegal for any American Indians to live within the boundaries of the state of Missouri. The original inhabitants called themselves Neonkonska, people of the middle waters, and they were known to the French as Wajaji. We, we call them today the Osage, and along with them, the Illinois, Kaskaskia, Peoria, and others, seven in that confederacy. The Spanish moved Shawnee. They also were disinherited from their lands. So Missouri has not a happy record when it comes to indigenous peoples. So for that matter, we remember them at all our presentations. And if you're anxious to know how much they were given for Missouri in the northern half of Arkansas, it was $2,500, a place to trade in the blacksmith. Now, on a brighter note, <laughs> that's kind of a serious way to start things. But I think with what we have going on in our country today, it's best to remember things that really matter. And... Uh, because in the inside, we make the right choice. And it wasn't made in 1836 when Littleburn Bog said it would be illegal for any Indians to live in Missouri. Okay, so we're talking about our favorite naturalist, John J. Audubon and his association with Rosier. And by the way, one of my cousins married a Rosier. <laughs> As you know, many of the French moved from St. Genevieve, 
started probably 1830s, maybe 1840s. And many French families moved to other locations. However, some stayed with us, thank goodness. Now, if you want to go on a fun day trip, go to the capital or the county seat of the Osage Nation in northeastern Oklahoma, and you will go to the big city cemetery and see all the tombstones, and you'll see the names Valet, Shoto, Sophia, Little Bear, Shoto, Papan, all those Frenchmen married Osage women. And they had to because they were in the fur trade. No man could preserve and felt buckskin as well as those women. And of course, you know, in the 18th century, they were the style. In Paris, the uh, dandies paraded with their buskins, skin tight. Now, I think they had to put them on wet like a chamois. <laughs> with their small swords, they, they, they set the styles, but that was the fur trade. Now, coming in shortly after the height of the fur trade, we have the most famous naturalist, I think, in the world. Uh, a man of tremendous talent, and I'm not going to talk about the art, the prints, that's coming up. But what I want to talk about was what did he use to gather specimens? What do you think? How are you going to get some of those birds, hummingbirds, swifts, uh, hawks? How are you going to get those specimens? Somebody said, uh, trap them. How many of you tried to trap birds when you were little? <laughs> <laughs> Did it work? Yeah. Did you? What'd you do? Run up and put a little salt on their tail and they wouldn't fly away? <laughs> you just get a box and you put a, a rabbit paw underneath or the oh, line okay. and you put corn underneath it and you yeah. just wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait. <laughs> How about that? That's a pretty doggone good way. Well, listen, today we've got a protocol we're going to have to follow very carefully because I'm going to pass these out so you can look at them. And they're all originals. Only one has had any restoration of any kind to it. Uh, please keep the muzzles up because they work. And But I want you to hold them and look at them because J.J. Audubon was probably one of the greatest wing shots that ever lived. He was absolutely marvelous as a marksman. He was a very talented man and, and brilliant, and you know more about him in that respect than I do. But to look at the firearms he used, one of the things that surprised everybody, there was a rumor started at some time in the 19th century that he knew Daniel Boone. That's highly, highly doubtful, though the old colonel was living, you know, up in the Defiance area. The other thing that follows that is marksmanship with a flintlock. No. 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 <laughs> he was a thoroughly modern, very discriminating individual when it came to firearms, and he did not carry anything junky. It would have been an insult. Glenn Chamber used to laugh about it. He was a famous photographer of the Department of Conservation here in Missouri. Glenn used to laugh. He didn't have a camera like Charlie Schwartz and Glenn Chambers had. He didn't have that. But he had to get those birds, and he had to keep them in good enough shape. Now, how many in here have shot quail when they were younger? Raise your hand. Okay. You know, you have to be careful. Uh... Wing shots, is there a part of that that they're actually born? You've seen some that are just incredible. I, I saw a fellow, I'm not kidding. This is a God's truth, so help me. And I'm not going to tell you who it was. 
probably some of you may have known him. He's deceased now. He's a railroad engineer. He had two good bird dogs and one big, great big liver and white pointer that he was exceptionally proud of. And he was going through a kind of a rickety fence. And he always wore that Comer hat with that BLF and E button. And he had a 20 gauge Model 12 Winchester pump gun. And of course, railroad engineer and that kind of salary, that was a skeet grade gun. But he was using it to hunt quail. And he didn't tear it up like a lot of folks. It just looked like it was brand new. And he had a hold of that rickety wire and had that Model 12. And two birds got up from a covey that they had just, and of course, dead bird and the dogs had retrieved. Took that gun up and pop. And that old 20 gauge and that puff of feathers, I'll never forget. I saw that and I thought, gee, many Christmas. What does that guy do? You know, he's got an eye doctor because he was in his 40s. And then I asked him and he went and got an old family album and there were pictures of him before World War II and they had their strings of quails when we had quail. And he always used the plural term quails. They're quails. Uh, you know, I'm saying. Okay. Now, Audubon was a better shot than that, if you can believe it. The only person I've ever known in my life that shot water out of a percussion gun. And I'm going to start with this one. This is a Lehman. It's an American-made smoothbore gun. It's about 28, between 28 and 26, maybe closer to 20. But you can you can put your finger down it because I'll I'll clean it when I get it put away. It's a nice light little gun. Now this is the cheapest gun on the table, and it's not a bad little gun. It's you know it's got some little inlays. It's an American made. It's Lehman, single trigger, and. Uh, the protocol on these is don't try to cock them or work any mechanisms because they might have a little slag or something in that spring and it'd go blink and a piece of wood come flying out the bottom because they're long leaf springs. But I want you to hold it and look at it. Now, this is old tried and true. The only good portrait I've seen that he painted of himself when he was young, he's got one of these. It's laying across his lap. So I asked Glenn Chambers, and of course Glenn's deceased now, cancer got him. He's told me as much as I know, and of course he was the one that did the massive amount of reading on Audubon. Glenn said that there's a possibility he used fresh bread and made a dough ball run down that muzzle on a very, very tiny charge of powder. Now this is a real trick. Those of you that have ever shot muzzle-loading guns or gotten around old-time, if you're old enough to have ever talked to an old-time market hunter, small charge, lots of shot if you're a market hunter. With him, it was small charge, small amount of shot. You don't want to tear up a specimen that you're going to make into a what? piece of art. You want ever feather. Uh, there's a couple different ways of doing it. So what he may have done for very small swifts, hummingbirds and that nature, Glenn thinks he had fresh bread, went to a bakery and got a loaf of fresh bread and make a dough ball like you like to make, eat, mom whip your butt, waste yeah. bread, you know that and run that dough ball down on your charge. Not real hard. Run that dough ball down there, but be sure it's firm. And then you go after that little bitty quarry and you take a sip out of your flask and when you get ready for a shot and you don't wait long. It's going to dissolve that bread and he would knock small birds out of the air just the concussion. That's the truth. Now you got a bad little look, but that's the truth. He was that good. 
You try it. Get you one of these. They're not too expensive. <laughs> Do you have one? Well, we're going to pass this one around. It's a Lehman. It's made in Pennsylvania. And it's the beginning of the what? The Industrial Revolution in, the, in North America. We've got a nice company owned by a Moravian descended family of gun workers and gunsmiths, Lehman, and they're building a nice little shotgun worth the money. So he probably wore out several of those guns. Being a smoothbore gun, what can you do if you have an accident and you get in mud or something in the muzzle? Boom! He'll split it. Not the bridge, but it'll ruin the barrel. And, you know, I'm sure he didn't do much of that, but it may have happened. You never know. So anyway, that's all tried and true. He probably got 90% of his specimens. Now, did he use a shot snake? You've seen them. They're the long tube with the Irish. No, I don't think so. I think he was probably carrying very, very small size shot in a flask. He probably carried his powder and shot in one of these. And of course, the shot's in a leather body, one in the powder's in a... Now, this one's got powder in it. Hear it? And what you do is you hold your finger, and you got a gate, and you open the gate, and there's your charge. And then you open the gate again, and the charge... You can even put a little in your hand and taste it. It's not harmful like modern propellant. It's... You can... How many of you got a ham for Easter? Did you have ham for Easter? It had the main ingredient that's in there in it to keep the meat pretty pink. Otherwise, what's a ham do if you cure it and you don't put that? Turns gray. <laughs> yeah, gray. They eat good, don't they? But, you know, if you've got a ham like that on your table and Grandma sees it, she's going to fuss. So anyway, he used a small amount of powder and a small amount of shot so that he would not tear up the specimen. Now, he was also in the process of doing mammals. And mammals don't respond well to small amounts of shot. They'll run off. Or if it's a big mammal, they'll try to bite you. So, believe it or not, and this is a rare thing, Usually, boys and girls, and I'm not being funny about this, a good rifle shot is a very poor wing shot with a shotgun. Yep, I got an ascent on that. You got to be careful. Uh, this is two shots. This is a winder. It's two barrels. And I, I don't want you to do this, but if you operate this lever and do a 180, the loaded barrel comes up on top. It is heavy as the dickens. There's enough stuff here to build two rifles. It's what you got. You got two barrels. But I want you to see this. And here in the butt, if you've got a good stout nail, is a cap box. And this is an expensive rifle. This was made in upstate New York. This is not a cheapo. When you say expensive, and that's two shots. So if by chance he needed a second shot, doubtful, but there you go. And that gun also had a separate set of target sights for long range shooting. And you can see the dovetails where the, the globe and bead goes in the front. And then in the tang, there's a lollipop, you know. Now, I always save the best for second to the last. We know he owned at least one of these. Now, here's your riddle today that you're going to solve. This is a shotgun the likes of which most people never even get to hold one. This shotgun is made in London in the minories. 
but not by an Englishman. That's your riddle. You've got to figure out what happened. And I'll let you think for a little while. Now, if you're sitting there looking and you've seen enough of these muzzle-loading shotguns, it's very seldom that you see this differentiation like this gun has on its two triggers. See how small that front? This is the one for the right barrel. The back is for the left barrel. Sometimes, but not always, sometimes that left barrel is jug-choked. They take a cutter with a very, very fine radius and cut a small indentation, almost a polish, about that far back from the muzzle, and it causes a shot to condense. So it stays in a pattern longer than the cylinder bore barrel. 99.9% .9 of these guns are cylinder bore, particularly the cheapies and the medium, and even the best grade, English. But this is made by Manton. This is French. He was Huguenot that fled France, and his family set up a gun-making business. And even the King of England had to wait for a Manton. Audubon had at least one. Now this gun has been modified a bit. It's had a piece put in here very carefully to give it more pull so that somebody inherited it, probably. Uh, just look at the way this gun is put together, and I want you to sight. That is incredible for a muzzle-loading shotgun. And it's French, but made in the minories in London. Be very, very careful with this, but I want you to just feel quality. Uh, toward the end of the 19th century, when England's empire was becoming large and had all those African animals, and big animals, these guys got to making double barrel rifles. So an Englishman up in that howdah had two shots, 60, 70, 80 caliber, knocked down a rhinoceros, charging lion, you name it. Those are probably some of the finest guns ever made. And they still make them. You can buy one if you got enough money. That doesn't belong to me. <laughs> it belongs to a friend. <laughs> now, coming to Daniel Boone, whee! There's an awful lot of legend around him. And the locals in the early days of the 19th century, prior to the Civil War, even the Mexican War, the locals on Sunday after Mass around here, we've got lots of eyewitnesses. They might eat a little lunch. You know, they've been to confession and they've gotten there. <laughs> host and just a little lunch and they take off for where they've got a shooting match. Now the trick on these shooting matches around here there are two ways of scoring. You can take three out of five shots to count with a 13 point bull meaning a 39 is the best and then you get a for a driving in the center, you get an X. So that's one way of it. The other one is you shoot at a white cut on a charred board, a white X, and they measure the group, the smaller the group with a string, and each person has to give the judge so many half balls, and I'll show you how you can mold a half ball for this rifle. Anyway, I've got the mold for it. And then they, the shortest string wins first place. That's first relay. Now, ties are shot off on the last relay. Usually, they were shooting for a beef, the four quarters, the hide and taller, and then the final sixth place was the block the target block with the lead in it. And whoever got that 
could split it up, burn it over a piece of sheet, tin in the fireplace, and save the lid. So they were pretty good shots as, on an average. And uh, this one has had a little restoration, but it works good, shoots good, and uh, it's got a little oily rag. This is Indiana, made in Indiana, and his name's on the top of it, Burns, and it's about 28 caliber. Audubon could take just about anything with a shotgun, but 10%, uh, a big fish eagle, probably hit them somewhere in this right here and break that breastbone, but not so bad that it distorts it because he's going to have to use it as a model. But what you want to do is get it to where he can't fly and falls. And he's so used a rifle. Now, I doubt if you shot anything much bigger than this, even with a rifle. And there's a little mold for that rifle, this little fella. But a small amount of powder, one of these little balls, a coyote, easy. Know what you're doing, right? You got to know what you're doing. So I'll pass this around. This, by the way, is made of the gang mold. I did not bring it in. It's military gang mold. It makes buckshot in two sizes. Those cartridges, as Archie calls them, that that militia company carried, had three, six, or nine buckshot in one big ball. So they were interesting when they cut that, characters. Would, would they smooth that at all? Do you fish? Pardon me? Did you fish as a young lady? Did you go fishing a lot? I go fishing. Oh, yes, when I was young. <laughs> yeah. Love yeah, my, my mom liked to fish. Did you ever go duck hunting with your... No, no, I didn't do You that. didn't do any shooting? No, I never... Sh I okay, I well, I was thinking, uh, there are occasional times I've talked to people in the audience with this little show. <laughs> Judge S.P. Dalton, who I think was one of the greatest sportsmen that ever walked the face of the earth, bought his wife a very fine double barrel shotgun for Christmas. <laughs> and he always wanted her to go duck hunting with him. And he lived on Elmarine Avenue in Jeff City and I had a paper out, came by every Friday evening and collected the 30 cents for the Jeff City News and Tribune. And Mrs. Dalton was always laughing, had a funny story or something. And she told me a good one on Judge and herself. And she said, Judge wanted to go duck hunting. And she said, Jimmy, the weather was absolutely terrible. But she said the ducks were flying. And she said, Judge wanted to go so bad. And she said, he didn't go to church. He got her up early and they took off and they went duck hunting. And she said, we were walking across a bottom field. And she said, Judge stepped off in a slough. And she said, he actually went down and his hat. <laughs> well, said he come out and had his shotgun all wet and said he was drenched. And I'm standing there with my little clipboard, those little receipts and she said guess what he did Jimmy and I said well I guess he wanted to go home get warmed up or something she said no she said he took his clothes off and had me help him wring him out <laughs> standing on a stump somebody had cut a cottonwood down and he was standing on a cottonwood stump and I was helping him wring his clothes out and he insisted on going back to hunting with those damn clothes she said, now that's just what he is. And I thought to myself, well, I think that's pretty neat. <laughs> I really did. 
And I've always thought, up here, I wish we had more people like him. I really do. Thank you. If you've got any questions, I'm with you for as long as you want to ask. But you've got two more programs on him, and this will give you a little background, make you feel a little better. But he had to be one of the best wing shots that ever lived. You said expensive. So back then when Audubon would buy a gun, what would that gun cost? Oh, God. That Manton double barrel. <coughs> Those guns today are in the thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. In his day, uh, and I, I'm going to base this on receipts of the uh, Shoto Company in St. Louis and Campbell, uh, Sublette and Campbell early records, a good heavy bore rifle manufactured in St. Louis is going to cost you between 12 and 15 dollars. Now a light little fellow like this Lehman is going to sell for about three, maybe five at the most if it has to go up the river. That always adds to the cost. If that has to go up the river, the farther it goes, the costlier it gets. And likewise, a gun this complex, if it breaks down in the middle of nowhere, you're in trouble. Because uh, uh, it would be very difficult for a blacksmith to fix it. You need a gunsmith. But... The thing that makes this Manton gun so valuable is the quality of the workmanship that goes in it. I hope you noticed when you were looking at it, those locks are set not parallel to the barrel. Uh, it just has so many features that are totally different. The fact that you can quickly get back on that lift if it's jug choked, or anyway, you're going to get a second shot. Uh, there's just so much here to be excited about, and if you noticed, it's not terribly fancy, faulty raw, beautifully engraved and checkered, but it is so, just to pop that gun up and just, mmm, just such a neat gun. I wish it were mine, but it's not. <laughs> I, I borrowed, you know who I borrowed it from. Oh, yeah, he's still living. He's so old he doesn't <laughs> know when his birthday is. <laughs> had, he had a beautiful collection, and he's cut way, way down on account of his got two daughters, and they got after him, told him, Dad, you're going to get your house broken into and robbed. And he did fix a house up. He, he got an old house and fixed it up real nice, but... He's got about 80 guns left, and he, that's one of them. I, and he said, now, if you lose that, and I said, I promise. I won't lose it. I promise. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's as proud of that as anything he's got. He's got some dandy Kentuckys, but that is quite a gun. And Audubon did use a Manton. He was probably... In arrears on that gun, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 120, maybe even 150 dollars. But it would never break, no matter where he was, what he was doing. He could fall in the water, take it apart, wipe it clean, oil it, put it back together, no problem. It would never. He never have to worry about slagging one of those lock springs and a lock break on him. Not like poor Penny in the yearling. <laughs> When old slew foots on top of him and he had his old army musket, remember? Spring broke. Well, it actually collapsed and slew killed his good dog. Did, did he have a different gun for the mammals? Hmm? Did he have a different gun yeah. for the mammals? Well, if he was after mammals, I doubt if he used shotgun. He was either with that winter rifle or a single shot rifle. He was as good with a rifle as he was. That's the thing that makes him such a, an interesting character. Like we said, you know, you take a good wing shot, he's not, as a rule, not a good shot with a rifle. But he was with both. And uh, he was a character. Sorry. What little I know about him. <laughs>
<laughs> now you talk about that Rosier trip up in New Orleans. That was amazing. <laughs> but he was a very nice looking young man when he was young. Very, very handsome. And so we know... Uh, he would probably, when he went out to shoot birds, he would shoot a lot of them over the course of an afternoon. Well, you know why he was here? Because this is, and I messed up, shame on me, good for you. This is the largest flyaway in the world. Mississippi Valley, vertical, north-south, is the largest flyaway in the world. Mm -hmm. Largest. More birds migrate. And in his day, boy, were they migrating. And uh, he recognized populations. He, used, he had a lot of insight. And we didn't find out about the bluff nesting geese until the Schwartz family you know, were brought in from their work with the Nene in uh, Hawaii, Charlie and Libby Schwartz. And we find that those bluff nesters, the giant Canadas, are Pleistocene geese. They're an isolated population that's been here since the Pleistocene. They're adjusted to where are you going to migrate when there's nothing but an ice sheet north of the Missouri River. They have their youngsters, and the youngsters have to jump all the way down. And in the old days, they had to cross the MKT railroad tracks to get to the river. And when those geese molt, and they can't fly. And those big fellows are running around on the sandbars and they're extremely good at hiding. And if you mess with a nesting pair, the gander is absolutely, he's in the Napoleon of the bird world. You'll get chased. So, you know, and they, it's, it's a marvelous universe. After all, they've been around a long time and they're better adjusted to the environment than we are. Much better adjusted to the environment than we are. So hopefully if we do what we're supposed to and get things turned around environmentally, we're working on it, but it hasn't been, we haven't been lucky on a lot of, a lot of stuff. They are increasing in numbers, most of them, and of course the DU people have a lot to do with that, and I noticed, believe it or not, this is a little sideline hit, there's often a late print by Audubon as a prize when they have the big DU drawings, and people pay a lot of money to get those tickets. Do you have one? Do you have? I have a late one. I've got one. And think how long it took me to run that down. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Yeah, his prints, I, I was going to bring a book on prints. I found one, and I wanted to bring it so bad to tell you how much those things are worth today. Very, very expensive. Any more? Oh, yes, sir, I'm sorry. I got this hammer back. And I oh, no, no, here. You know how to do that, don't you? <laughs> no, and I don't want to break it. <laughs> you won't break it. And pull it all the way back. And now this is one that trips it. I ain't gonna do it, is it? Pull it all the way back and then pull the forward trigger. Yeah. They work. And look how little that is. It's a BB. Almost. The BB's 0.177, isn't it? 0.177. We use BB size shot for turkey around here. Turkey loads. And he's shooting one on the BB. He was good. He was a good one. Any other questions now? I got a question. If you're mold there, did they have to trim? How much trimming did they do on that little ball? Oh, uh, a lot of those molds have a sprue cutter on them. That little stem is called a sprue. S P R U E. If your wife calls you that, you better run. Because that's not a pretty, in the 19th century, that wasn't a pretty name. 
sweetie or honey or something like that, you're okay, but if she calls you a sprue, take off. <laughs> Put her in high gear, pull the throttle out all the way to the firewall. Um, there's a sprue cutter on those. And they usually, when they're making those balls, they'll, it's called running. The manufacturing is called running. And you cut them and put them back in the pot. And on an old wood stove, they usually have an extra plate that they had a hole made in the fiddle lid pot so they could run shot if they were hunters. And now you get electric pots. They have to be hooded. You got to have ventilation because you know wood vapor. I mean, lead vaporizes and makes you and you become like a mature green pepper. <laughs> Heavy metal poisoning. Any others? Yes, sir. What kind of wood is that? Hmm. What kind of wood? I'm done. Stock. Stock. This one. What kind of wood? Oh, that's a piece of eastern uh, curly maple. They grade this out when they're making flooring for uh, bowling alleys. It causes the knives on the planers to chatter. And it, you know, so they grade it out. And it's called tiger tail or fiddleback. The other thing it, it does is it Old eastern red maple, and that's the kind you can get maple syrup out of, is, is the wood. And it is torsion growth, and what's going on is the wood grain looks like the hair the girls used to iron out, and it goes like this. And you got hard, soft, hard, soft. And the finish on these, and the reason why I tell everybody don't touch them, no matter how dirty and nasty, take it somebody knows what's going on. Because the old timers, what they did to get this pretty color, they liked that. So they'd scrape them with a sharp pocket knife. And you can sharpen your knife real good on a white navaculite, and you can scrape shavings so fine. And then when that's done and you burnish it, piece of cooked beef bone about the size of this finger and you compress and you can if you do enough of it you can kind of feel the differentiation and most of them not all of them most of them have violin stain an alcohol based violin stain and then you seal it in with boiling seed oil in some cases they take nitric acid that's had metal filings to buffer it, make a buffered solution, put it on there and heat it by heating up a chunk of iron in the forge and then holding it up and it'll bring that grain out. Either way, you ruin the finish if you do anything to it. And find somebody that knows what they're doing and they'll tell you how to make it clean without ruining the finish because a finish like that is it's it's purposeful. They spend a lot of time putting that on that gun to make it look pretty. They were still making guns look pretty in his day. <laughs> they get ugly after Civil War. Then they become utilitarian things, things that kill people. But prior to that time, they were used to feed the family and whatever else you needed to do. And if you needed to uphold your honor, you can do one of these. <laughs> you better get the distance. Don't do like the pistol shooters and shoot at 12 feet. <laughs> you know Lincoln got into a duel. You know that. You better believe it. And what did he do? He had a little short, stocky guy that didn't have enough sense to feed a goose. And the little guy called him out. Well, that gives Lincoln choice of weapons. He chose sabers. Now what did Abraham get when he was little? Rented out by his daddy and he knew how to cut corn with a corn knife. And that's back when the little giant corn knives looked like sabers. And he got this little shave tail military clown out on Bloody Island and Lincoln had a saber and he was cutting buds off. 
Well, he had an immense uh, farm span. Plus, the comment was even made at his postmortem. The man's body was absolutely perfect. He had worked himself as a kid right on up through adulthood and never quit. He was an athlete. You got to remember, he was one heck of a wrestler, remember? Won matches against some really nasty guys that would have liked to have gouged eyes and bit noses and ears. So, don't do one of these unless you're a Cracker Jack. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, folks. You've been a sweet, decent audience. Thanks for putting up with me. Again, James Duncan has been our guest uh, today, and we thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's wonderful.